All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I, I think that we're going to have a few more join us uh, as they are trying to download the GoToMeeting app. Uh, sorry for the last minute cancellation, but I imagine this, this is probably normative in your world at this point. Uh, but thanks for joining us here for the 100, the monthly 100 families meeting. Uh, we are recording this so that we can post it for those that were unable to join. Um, and so, and I see where we have some more joining us right now. Um, I'm going to turn the, the meeting over to Sarah, where our agenda, I'm sorry, to Karen. Uh, our agenda today is to review the status of our collaborative clients, as we usually do. Uh, then we're going to hear from one of our clients who uh, spoke a number of months ago at one of our meetings. We'll get an update from Amanda. Um, and then, we, um, then we're going to talk about uh, COVID-19 response for our families. Um, what do we do to uh, care for those, especially those without the ability uh, to travel? Um, and then we have a new service that we're going to be offering to all combined uh, clients, and we'll review that. And we'll have some Q&A at the end. Maybe a, uh, we've allotted two hours for the meeting. Usually, I imagine we'll run about an hour, hour and 15 today. So thanks for joining us. Karen, you want to review our uh, the status of our slides. And Sarah here in Little Rock with me will be advancing these slides. Um, Hey, so everyone is muted as you've joined, but if you have a question uh, as we go through, uh, please just unmute and uh, and ask your question, and we'll try to get all the information out in, uh, to you today. So, Karen, why don't we start walking through the status? Yeah, there's also a chat box if you prefer that. So, um, and I have that open and looking at those as they come in. So good morning. Um, I'm uh, missing all your faces, but uh, thank you for joining us in this way this morning. Um, the collaboration, you can go ahead and advance. Um, we kind of always have that very first slide that, that shows all of your signatures, just reminding you of our, um, Sarah, can you advance? Yeah. Oh, okay, it takes a minute, I guess. Uh, just showing the um, all of you that you have, you know, signed on to this collaboration, and that this is a community uh, program. It's uh, not just a Restore Hope program, but um, it involves all of you very intimately, and um, we appreciate all that you do um, for the families in our community. Uh, you can advance again. So I wanted to show us quick slide because we all know the the cost as far as emotional um, that are to children and families whenever um, a child is placed in, in foster care. But I also want to show you that it's a financial burden um, as well, uh, you know, for taxpayers. And of course, that shows kind of the amount per child. And we have about two and a half, we average about two and a half children per family. Um, and so, I mean, we don't know the full cost, but we do know that it's an enormous um, cost whenever children go into care. So if we can prevent that upstream by helping struggling parents, we want to do that. And that's um, one of the things that um, 100 Families is, is working hard to do is um, meet families right at their, their time of crisis um, and bring them to stability so that um, we can save families both trauma um, and uh, the cost that is involved with uh, children in care. Okay. So as of February 29th, we had 149 families in the 100 families. That's active families, and that represents 354 children. You can advance. Um, it's a, our goal is, of course, we, we meet with clients that need reunification, so their children are already in care, and we help that. You can advance. Uh, we also help keep families together, so protective services cases. And these are real families, y'all, so one of the joys uh, that we get to do is families get free family photos, and that last family you just saw said she hadn't had a family photo since 
her oldest was a baby, like a professional photo. So it's really fun to get to see um, the the families get their their pictures together and be able to share and just be proud of their family, you know, and say, hey, this is who we are. So this is what we show every single time. Um, the hundred families clients at intake. Sorry, guys. <laughs> 100 families clients at intake, um, and we go from crisis to thriving. We uh, do a 14 point assessment, and this is just six of those areas that we assess um, at intake, and that is across the board. So, no matter what point of contact these families um, come uh, into the program through, um, whether it's the rescue mission or over at steps taking parenting classes and getting case management there or um, it's through Hamilton House and um, the resource center there they they are all being assessed the same and um, we have definitions for that and that helps us as a community to learn where are people at what areas of crisis do they have um, and then uh, we Every month, of course, we continue to follow up with those clients and we continue to find out collectively as um, an initiative, how are we doing? How, how are our families doing, which is the most important thing? And we find that we are moving families out of crisis. You can see that the crisis lowers um, and we are moving families to stability. I was really excited this month because we had a lot of families move to stability transportation and I bet you can guess why <laughs> a lot of our families did get tax refunds and invested in vehicles and that that's an important thing for a family to have um, so I was you know very pleased that they're you know investing in their families in that way um, and then we uh, also of course continue to have really good outcomes regarding employment um, our outcomes, of course, in food are amazing. We avert crisis, almost 100% aversion of crisis in the area of food. Although when they do come to see us, they have no food resources. 28% had no income, no uh, food stamps. I'm sorry, guys. Um, I keep getting messages because people are trying to get on. <laughs> they are messaging me about that, but I can't handle that right now. Um, but the housing as well, uh, we can avert crisis very quickly. Um, getting people to stability is a little bit more difficult, but we are able to do that. Um, get them into safe, decent housing, and you can just see that in the slides. Um, and we'll focus in on housing and employment real quick if you go to the next slide. So employment at intake, you see that bright red crisis. So at intake, we had 48% that were in crisis. And as of February 29th, there were only 22% in crisis. But you'll also see that our stability increases quite a bit um, from 32% to 45%. Move forward. And the same thing in housing, you'll see our crisis. Uh, we had 43% of our families were literally homeless. And then um, as of uh, February 29th, there was only 8% and we are moving people to stability and high housing um, from 30% to 54% as of Feb February 29th. So um, thankfully we have been, uh, our partnerships with the Housing Authority, um, with CSCDC's ESG program, um, with uh, you know, domestic violence preferences. There's just um, a lot of resources. And then also we have um, a voucher specific for our families in 100 families um, that is a tenant-based rental assistance program that we partner with the Housing Authority on as well. So that helps move families um, out of crisis and into stable housing, decent, good housing um, very quickly. Okay, move forward. So um, Amanda is here with us today. She just went to check on her baby. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, we'll bring her on in here. Um, uh, first off, I just want to report to you that Amanda um, had something really exciting happen. You know, you've met her before. She's talked several times. You knew that her children were on trial home placement. Well, um, what, what just happened this week? 
He called me at 1030 at night to tell me. <laughs> Our case got closed. Yes, yeah, so that case is actually closed now with DCFS, which was a really exciting thing for you. Is it <laughs> this is Lemony. Um, and so I wanted to, Amanda, okay. to then recap just a little bit of her story again to you because um, uh, she had a lot to, to overcome um, and we're so proud of her for what she has done. Um, so why did your children go into care if you don't mind just recapping that? So the night that uh, my children were taken, my husband and I were arrested. Um, it was for theft of property, but the charge was later dropped because it was something that it was a mix up. We, di we didn't do it. But um, when we were arrested, we were on drugs. So the when they called um, DHS because we we're not from here, we don't have any family around here to come take our kids. Um, they had to call DHS, so DHS came and drug tested us, and when I came up positive, we were arrested, the kids were taken. And let me tell you, um, Amanda and Patrick were referred by their caseworker, so their caseworker immediately began working with them, um, and they came up to see me, and I'd never seen a couple just so, broken and um, telling me, you know, you know, Patrick, grown man, there he is, he's um, <laughs> uh, just crying in my office saying, you know, I did this, I did this to my kids, and they don't deserve it. Um, so they immediately owned their part in it um, and immediately began working very hard to do their case plan. So um, we came alongside them and we're so excited to help them along the way. But let me tell you, they, they had a lot of obstacles. Um, you know, just like many of our families do, the obstacles that they had were overwhelming and they could not overcome them by themselves. So um, kind of tell us some of the obstacles you were facing. So um, our case had opened in July of last year. Um, my husband at the time was in school, so I was the only one working. Um, we had fallen behind on our bills. That was um, one of the biggest things from the beginning was we can't get our kids back if we get evicted because we haven't paid rent or because our electricity is shut off. So, um, baby, Karen um, helped to point us in the direction of resources for that. Um, HUD and the um, CSC DC mm -hmm. for the electrical help. Um, we needed things like a baby bed so that we could start getting um, super unsupervised visits at home, and the care portal helped us with that. Mm -hmm. um, we also, um, my husband didn't have a license, so we had gotten pulled over. Um, which ended up being a big issue with lots of tickets that we are still paying off. And um, Patrick is now working to get his license back, so that should be sometime soon. Um, I am working to get my license back. It'll be a little bit longer on mine because it's expensive, but it's going to happen soon. And that is really awesome. Um, he hasn't had a license in eight years and I have it in five. So I'm really excited about that. I feel like we're becoming real adults now. <laughs> yeah. um, we had transportation issues after um, we had gotten all these tickets, um, trying to get Patrick to work in school and the kids to school and everything. So um, Karen had helped us with bus passes, which were super helpful. Um, Patrick was spending like $100 a week in cabs once he graduated school, so it was very expensive. It was an overnight, he worked an overnight job, which means you can't use the transit, you know, so the bus passes weren't good anymore for that, but um, thankfully uh, they have, you know, really worked with 100 families and we have a resolution uh, program we're going to tell you a little bit about here in a minute that is has been a big help to them and is continuing to be a big help to them that we're very excited about. Um, they, hey, um, hey, hey. 
sorry. <laughs> Lemony is causing some havoc in the background. <laughs> Um, it's okay. <laughs> she took my phone. <laughs> uh, but let me tell you, uh, the, also, um, I wanted her to tell you a little bit about the emotional support that was provided. Do you want to sit up here with me? You want to hear? Come on. Tell, tell them about, um, about the emotional support and that kind of thing that you really needed probably more than the monetary stuff yes really. <laughs> so um whenever our kids were taken you know you don't have a whole lot of support it's hard to find anybody that is um kind of going to sympathize with your situation because you put yourself in that situation um <clears throat> so once um we started meeting with karen and crudy also at um steps they were so supportive of us and anytime that we just felt like we couldn't do it or um things just weren't going our way we talked to karen or we talked to trudy and i don't know how many times that they kind of built my confidence back up that we could do this that it wasn't going to be a lifelong situation and we didn't completely ruin our lives and really helped to um make it something better Good. So yeah, that was an important part. And I mean, she just sometimes needed someone just to talk to about the the situation she was going through. And, um, you know, one of the most exciting things is that how fast she got her children back. I mean, your case opened in July, July 8th, and then um, trial home placement, trial home placement started September. And I think our first um, unsupervised visit was August 25th, and then two weeks after that was when trial home placement started. And then we got custody back in December, on December 12th, and then just Wednesday, they closed our case. We were supposed to have court Thursday, and our case was, our caseworker texted us at 9 o'clock and was like, no court, case is closed. <laughs> okay. So, you guys. I just wanted to share that story with you. Um, we're so proud of Amanda and so um, and all that she has accomplished. And um, wanted to lead this into call what we're going to be doing to help every single hundred families um, participate from here on out with these same kind of issues. Um, a lot of people don't have driver's license. A lot of people have suspended driver's license, and a lot of people have court issues. Go ahead. Well, thanks, Yo. And Amanda, congratulations to you for all the accomplishments. Uh, we really are proud of you. Um, as Karen and Amanda pointed out, uh, suspension of driver's license is one of the main, um, or I, I would say it's a significant barrier to our clients uh, moving from crisis to career. Uh, we see this in, let's advance this next slide. We have some statistics for you. Here, uh, what we have found with the uh, programs that we partner in for Restore Hope is that we're a reentry client who are um, high needs and low risk, or I'm sorry, low resource, that 67% of those clients have a suspended driver's license. They have an outstanding district court issue that is um, in the way of them having a valid driver's license. 30% of those clients, uh, those reentry clients, have multiple district court issues. Um, and then with our alternative sentencing clients, as we've done an analysis on them, uh, it's higher, it's 80%, which makes sense because those clients are coming from a district court, so of course they have a district court issue, but 80% of them have a suspended driver's license because of that issue. And in Arkansas currently, um, when you uh, when you get a speeding ticket or a driving without uh, when you get some infraction and you don't pay the fine and you don't show up for court, you will get a failure to appear and a failure to pay. Well, uh, on your failure to appear, uh, your driver's license is suspended. So that's how that's happening. Uh, it is irresponsible behavior, but most of our clients that that we're engaging in. They're very afraid to go to court because they, that, you know, this isn't the only issue that they're dealing with. 
And so um, out of alternative sentencing, about 80 percent have a suspended driver's license. And as we did an analysis of the um, 140 to 150 clients that are in the families, um, collaborative cases, uh, 26 percent. So a quarter of those families have suspended driver's license. So let's advance the next slide here. And here are some of the reasons why driver's license are suspended. These are the, as we've done our analysis of all clients from those three different issues, our three different areas, here are the major reasons why. Um, uh, driving under the influence, uh, failure to appear is a big one, failure to pay, another one, uh, outstanding child support, non-payment on child support, and then of course they've had an accident without um, any insurance. And so um, what became apparent to us about a year ago, although we didn't realize fully the extent of the issue, was that our clients need some advocacy to be able to uh, resolve those outstanding court issues um, because it is a major barrier as we think about their journey from the point of crisis that we meet them in to uh, to kind of resolving all outstanding issues and having a career, a living wage job. And so what we started doing about a year ago and what we would announce uh, today is that um, we have an arrangement with Arkansas Driver Control uh, and have had that arrangement, but we've just been given online access to, to the database through the portal where every new 100 families client that is onboarded through the Hope Arc system now will have this court um, resolution report uh, run on them. And so what we what we do for Restore Hope to help support the alliance uh, is we search the driver control database. That gives us uh, access to all of the issues that would uh, suspend someone's driver's license. So th th this isn't all issues out there. If they have an outstanding district court uh, case, uh, they've got fees and fines, and it's not attached to their driver's license, then uh, it won't show on our report. But as you can see from the percentages uh, that we showed a couple of slides ago, this is a major issue and, and it is affecting one quarter of all 100 families clients and 80% of all, all sentencing clients. So we search a driver control database. Um, we will then capture all of the data that is attached. So outstanding fees and fines, failures to appear, warrants. We will uh, take that data and prepare a report uh, for you as the case manager. Um, and then we will call our court resolution team, will call the courts out there and attempt to negotiate with them or attempt to communicate with them, letting them know that our client, I use that in the broadest collective sense, our client uh, is in a program and that we're helping them uh, resolve these outstanding issues. And we would like to understand how it is that, that we could um, get the business inside this particular court done. Uh, and so through that communication, we are seeing that we are able to actually get many licenses reinstated. We're able to negotiate as an advocate on our client's behalf um, with uh, payment plans, that kind of thing. So all that will be typed up and put into our system, into a court report and made available to you. Um, and so we've been doing that for about a year for re-entry and uh, starting Monday, we will do it for every new uh, 100 families client. So uh, what that allows you to do as a, um, a provider for your clients is it, it allows you to, um, one, be aware of the issues that are out there. Because often, unless they, they self-disclose, um, you may not be aware of it but now you will be. But also we had some people that have real experience in communication with the courts and resolving these driver's license issues. Go ahead and spend what sometimes can be hours on the phone uh, following up with prosecutors and judges and court clerks, et cetera, and, and be able to support you in that way. Uh, that allows you uh, to take that information 
can help our clients build a plan for resolving those issues. Because what we see over and over again is a client will get on the way in the journey to resolving outstanding issues. Um, they'll get a job, uh, they're in recovery, uh, they'll get a better job, but they don't deal with the, the issue in Kansas. And then they slow roll through a stop sign get pulled over, get another ticket, find out that they're driving on suspended license without insurance. They may take a trip to jail, even though it's a it's a day trip and they're released that day, they're OR'd. Uh, they might be late to work. Um, that may be the last time that work allows them to be late, to lose their job, they lose their job, and it snowballs. And so th this is a very important thing and a service that we're uh, quite excited to be able to bring to this alliance uh, starting Monday. So every new client uh, onboarded. Do we have one more slide here? Uh, yeah, so the demo now. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. The, these are some screenshots of the Hope Arc system uh, and how it will look. We're actually going to show you a live demo of what that would look like inside of our system. Let's click one more over. Okay, and. And then we've got, this is a real client's um, uh, kind of comments to us. I can't explain how good it feels to drive legal. Um, this client, uh, she said, as she passed the police officers, and Chief Baker, I know you'll like this, as she passed the police officers, she no longer looked in the rearview mirror uh, because she had no reason to. Mm -hmm. Um, she was driving fully legal, and that was the first time that this particular client had done that in a number of years. I know you like that, Chief. <laughs> um, okay, Sarah's yeah. going to take us through and, and show us what that looks like in the software system. Um, we have a, j just for all of our providers out there that are licensed, this is a fully HIPAA compliant demo that we're doing. This is a um, fictitious individual here. So why don't we roll through? And then any uh, Q&A, any questions that you have, uh, we'll take your questions at the end here. So Sarah, let's let's run through this demo and show people how it would work and mm -hmm. what it would look like inside mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. So as you're already familiar with, this is what the client's um, homepage looks like in the Hope AR system. Um, and the court report will actually be over here where notes are stored. Um, and so as you can see, here's the court information form, which was input by our court resolution team. First, I'm just going to show you, um, we've also uploaded the um, official form from driver control that we were able to generate on the online portal, um, which showed this was from early February, what that client's um, outstanding requirements were. Um, from February 13th, and you can see this particular client um, had a suspension out of the Malvern District Court, the Rockport District Court, and also um, had a previous DUI, which they were required to complete an alcohol rehabilitation program for, um, which I know many of the providers that are in the 100 Families Initiative provide this um, state-approved alcohol rehabilitation program. Um, and then they also had this reinstatement fee of $1,050. And so just for some background on where that reinstatement fee comes from, every time a court suspends a license or every time that client gets a DUI, that reinstatement fee goes up either $100 or $150. So this client had about um, 10 different um, suspensions. I believe one of those was for the DUI. So um just for some context there. And then based on that, this is the court information form that um, we input all of that data in here. So as you can see, there are notes um, of the Malvern District Court here um, in the Rockport District Court. So we actually called each of these courts to find out specifically what um, the reason was for that license being suspended. So um, 
And upon calling the Malvern District Court, we actually were able to find out that um, the client had actually completed all of their requirements with that court. And so there shouldn't have been a suspension. So they were able to send a reinstatement letter straight over to the Office of Driver Control. So we actually run into that a lot. Um, and that always feels really great for our clients. And, you know, it just helps um, when officers, if an officer were to pull the client over, um, you know, in that um, hold had been on there, the officer, you know, would have seen a suspended license, but really there was no reason for that. So the, um, that court was able to send a reinstatement letter over. Um, the next court that we called was the Rockport District Court, and this client did have um, a failure to appear on a criminal trespass charge um, that he still needed to enter a plea on. Um, and so here you can see specific instructions that our um, court res resolution team um, was able to obtain from the court um, as to what this client needs to do to um, resolve those issues. Hey, real quick, mm -hmm. uh, Assistant Director for Reentry, Carrie Williams, is on. She just sent me a message that um, MAD, which is the alcohol program that many of the clients um, use to, to meet that requirement, uh, has contacted Director Williams, and uh, they're going to start training for uh, reentry and transitional directors so mm -hmm. that they can conduct uh, MAG classes and hopefully take care of some of these suspensions. Yeah. And the cost of the resume will be 10 bucks. Good. So it looks like we may, um, we may for some of our reentry uh, clients, which is one third of our 100 families clientele are under uh, felony supervision. And so mm -hmm. uh, looks like we may have some additional solutions or make mm -hmm. it a little easier to complete the MAD classes. Mm -hmm. And just for some context around the MAD classes, um, that would be this checkbox right here. Um, for some reason, this client isn't required to complete a MAD class. Either they've already done it. Um, usually when a client has a DUI, they're required to do the alcohol rehabilitation mm -hmm. program and the MAD class. Um, I'm not sure why this particular client um, isn't required to do the MAD class, but most are if they have a DUI. Um, so back over here um, to this Rockport District Court, um, there are specific instructions that the client um, needs to get the warrant served. Um, and if he brings, you know, um, certificates of programs they've completed or, you know, proof of any incarceration, a lot of times we see with our reentry clients that, um, they're, they've obtained FTAs while being incarcerated. And so, of course, courts, um, will release those FTAs as long as they know, um, have proof that the client was incarcerated. So um, we instruct the client to bring proof of incarceration um, if applicable. Um, and also, this is going to be really important to our clients. Um, we ask if the court will hold the client in jail. Um, and this particular court will um, will not. Um, and so we instruct the client there. That just helps break down some barriers that clients feel um, and just some of the intimidation um, and really motivates them to actually show up and take care of these issues. Um, so uh, additionally, the judge um, in this particular court would be willing to consider giving um, this client credit for any paperwork of previous incarceration. So um, Really, the role of the case manager here is to be an advocate for the client, help the advocate or help the client um, understand really what what's outstanding for them, what needs to be done, um, and also hold them accountable, making sure that um, they actually follow through with it. And, um, you know, your motivational interviewing skills come in here as well, um, because it, it sometimes takes a lot of motivating to um, walk a client through this, but what we found with um, sharing this information with clients and even letting them know that we've spoken directly with the court about their case um, helps them to feel a little bit less intimidated. Um, and then having a case manager to walk alongside them through this will, you know, hopefully break down some of those barriers even further. Um, so those are our goals here. Um, and if you, we know that this, you know, 
process is new, um, even, you know, dealing with courts or with, um, you know, driver's license suspensions may be new to some of you. So if you have any questions, um, you're always welcome to reach out to um, the court resolution team. Um, and in just a minute, I'll give you um, their information. But um, I just wanted to point out that down here, we also um, made note that of that re alcohol rehabilitation program, um, as well as the reinstatement fees. Um, and for clients that are reentry, I know that's a small percentage of our clients, um, but the reinstatement fee actually can be waived for those clients. So if they're in the bubble. If they're in the reentry bubble, so if they've been released from an ACC facility within the past six months, um, that reinstatement fee can be waived. So um, this is all notated in here as well. Um, so one last thing, I just want to show you the updated um, reinstatement requirements, which we pulled just yesterday. Um, and as you can see, that um, court that release the suspension is no longer listed. So that's what, um, you know, this, this initiative can do. It can um, just help clients move closer and closer towards getting those requirements lifted. Um, and so we're real excited about it. You know, and I, and I think this um, also, not, not only is it a service for the, uh, for the Alliance, um, but as clients start to, well, the number of people, and I, and I think it may be greater in our reentry clients, but the number of people that have been for many years, and Amanda talked about this, um, they, they don't know how to approach the court. It's been years since they've had a driver's license. Um, they're, they're trying to, to um, get out of kind of the, I think of it as a, as a hole. They're trying to climb out of a hole. And the ability now for the alliance to help them with this particular issue uh, has grown much greater. And as these things are starting to be resolved, uh, the weight that feels like is off of our clients is um, is noticeable in their mm -hmm. physical continence. Mm -hmm. We've seen it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And so, and it builds and it builds momentum, right? Mm -hmm. There's hope that you know I got that taken care of. It's been hanging around my neck for five years. Um, now I, I'm you know going to apply the additional hard effort needed to deal with some of these other things. Yeah. And I just want to point out one more quick. Sure, many of you may already know this, but you can easily print this note if the client wants a printed version by clicking that download, and then that um, generates it into a printable format. Um, so by clicking this download button right here. Um, just a couple things um, that we need um, in order to be able to pull this information. Um, so obviously the client would need to be in the HOPE AR system and how this will work is our court resolution team will um, automatically generate a new client list every week. Um, and then as long as we have the social security number in the system and a scanned TANF form, we will be able to generate that information for you. So make sure that when you are putting in the client's basic information, you fill out this social security number. So, um, and then one other thing, many of you already know this, but just as a reminder, make sure you click save changes. Otherwise, um, others will not be able to see that social security number. Um, and then to scan a TANF form, you would actually go here and just click this upload note button um, right here and you'd be able to scan a file and it would show up here, down here for um, our court resolution team. And we just need that um, because we're required to turn that in for every client that we work with. Um, and that also qualifies clients for the 100 Families program. Um, and then the final thing that you'll need to do is to add our court resolution um, individuals to um, the uh, clients your team um, because this allows them to have access to that client's file um, and just for your reference the person you would want to add is Kately Frazier or um, you can add Brian Graham who here is already on um, this client's care team 
but you would add either one of those um, and then we'll automatically um, generate um, the report and start calling the courts for the client. So no further action other than those three things is needed on your part. The social security number, the um, TANF form, and adding one of those two individuals to the care team. Um, so we're really excited. We are really excited mm -hmm. about this. Brian, uh, Brian Graham's online. Uh, Brian, I'll give you a second to uh, come off of mute, but um, can we give everyone kind of a um, an estimate? So I, I onboard Sarah as my client today. Um, there's nothing else needed from me other than gathering this information that Sarah just showed. We need social security number. And, um, and so I, I do the intake save that client, how long will it be uh, now before you start to communicate with me as the case manager around outstanding issues? Um, what will that workflow look like? So I'll let Brian chime in as well, but um, I would think that um, within, for sure within the week, there will be a court information form that is at least filled out with those um, minimal with the minimal information, the courts that have suspension. Um, now, this area may not be filled out. Um, it just depends on some different factors. We try to contact the court as quickly as possible, but of course, we'll have to see what the demand looks like as we start this. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, um, you know, it just depends on whether or not we're able, how quickly we're able to get in contact with that particular court. Um, and this um, form would also be uploaded within the week. So I would, I would definitely say that, but Brian can add anything um, else if he feels like it's appropriate. I may have him on mute. Um, no, it's him. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Comments. Another um, great tool that you can use if you have any questions, we can just communicate strictly on this um, message board. So um, we're trying to keep communication in the platform just to, um, you know, have everything in one place. Um, but if you have any questions of the information that was shared on the client, um, you can just type it in mm -hmm. here and that case manager that made the calls will be able to see your message and respond to that quickly. So, um, yeah. Questions? You can come off mute and ask or uh, put a question here in the chat box. <coughs> No? Okay. Hey, Karen, um, can we talk a little bit about COVID-19 and um, and our clients and how this might impact them and, and how we might help them through this period, which may last a number of months? Yes. Um, my biggest concern has been um, if schools close uh, the number of single parents that won't have childcare um, and will not be able to go to work. So um, I, I know, you know, that this is, there should be a, you know, congressional response or state response to that kind of thing. Um, but also I just thought as a, a group that um, holistically serves families, we need to um, be thinking of what to do for these families as, as, the crisis hits home for them, just, um, you know, for the pure sense of not being able to make an income. Um, and so, you know, we do have our United Way 100 Families Fund, and so I'd like to continue to try to get, get funding in that so that our 100 Families clients are, you know, get get behind on rent because of, you know, an employment child care issue that we are able to, to step in. Um, and uh, of course, you all heard about St. Anne Society not offering their assistance right now. Um, so we would, uh, you know, I have reached out to Deacon Greg about partnering um, with that fund. So we just, I think that um, as we get more news, um, 
and especially about school closings and things like that, that we need to um, immediately respond with a conference call and to continue to talk about this and be proactive and not just leave families alone to manage these things by themselves. So, um, and definitely please remember these families. I know that food will be an issue, all these things, but um, if you, uh, I know that our food network here in Fort Smith is amazing. And I believe that, you know, that area will be, you know, addressed and taken care of. It's the bigger um, ticket items <laughs> that I'm actually more concerned about because of the um, inability to um, work if that ends up being happening because you know these single moms don't have anyone else to watch their children and so if they're not able to work that would be a big issue so um i think that immediately upon new news we should just schedule some calls and we'll talk about that great okay any announcements or questions Uh, we did have several people contact and say they weren't able to join and so they would wanted to see a recording of this um i, I know you've been recording this whole time what are we going to do we'll post it onto our youtube channel and send out the link in our facebook uh 100 families group good okay well thank you all for joining sorry for the last minute um, rescheduling from in person to online. Um, we do pray for uh, each one of you and for our clients uh, during this time period. And um, starting Monday, uh, as clients are onboarded, we'll now begin the automatic uh, court resolution services that we just uh, just covered. Any questions or comments, please contact Karen or I, and uh, we'll see if we can't. Um, get those to you as quick as possible. Thanks so much.